Hello everybody and welcome to another A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough video. And in this video I'll be taking a look at calorimetry, which is my second exam question walkthrough for calorimetry. And calorimetry is a really important topic, but it is particularly important if you do AQA chemistry because it is required practical number two. And you can download this question in the description if you want to have a go at it first, or you can watch my video and you can see my thoughts, which I will write down in blue as well as talking about the question, and I'll give you the answers in green that are going to get you all of the marks. Okay, in this question we are exploring calorimetry and also Hess's law and also enthalpies of solution and hydration. And so the first part of the question sets the scene and says a student uses Hess's law to determine a value for the enthalpy change that occurs when anhydrous copper sulfate, copper 2 sulfate, is hydrated. And these are the formula of anhydrous and copper 2 sulfate. This enthalpy change was labelled delta H exp. Sometimes they would label that as enthalpy change R for reaction. And we can see that they've completed a Hess cycle by having an arrow going down for when they add water to the anhydrous copper sulfate to make the solution. And then another arrow from when they take the hydrated copper 2 sulfate and also make a solution. We get the same solution whichever of these two compounds we're hydrating. We always end up with aqueous copper ions and aqueous sulfate ions. And the first question asks us to state Hess's law. And quite simply, Hess's law is that the enthalpy change or heat energy change in a particular reaction is independent of the route or path taken. And we know that it only depends on where we start, which is going to be here, and where we finish, which is going to be here. And then they move on to ask us for a mathematical expression to show how these three enthalpy changes are related to each other by Hess's law. And since the enthalpy change is independent of the route taken, we know that starting here and finishing here is equivalent to or equal to moving down this arrow. So we're going the same way as the arrow. So enthalpy change one. And then we're going against this second arrow. So that means we're going against the arrow which represents enthalpy change two. And so that is minus enthalpy change two. And so overall, we need to write this expression to get us our mark. Then the question says to use those enthalpy change values that we've been presented with here to work out a value for the enthalpy change of the experiment. So we've got a value for enthalpy change one and enthalpy change two. Just note before we crunch those numbers in that enthalpy change one is exothermic, and that's very common for the anhydrous copper sulfate, whereas enthalpy change two is endothermic. Now, since we are ending up at the same solution, we've still got copper two plus and, and sulfate two minus, whichever method we use, what that tells us is that the lattice and the forces within the lattice must be stronger in the hydrated copper sulfate because more energy has to go in to break that lattice apart, which is why overall it's an endothermic process. And so what that means is we can say that the forces within the anhydrous copper sulfate are easier to break apart because we'll get the same energy released when we uh, produce our solution at the end of it. And so overall, that's why hydrated compounds are typically more endothermic or less exothermic than the anhydrous equivalent. And so Hess's law here, we're just literally plugging our values into the one that we've just calculated and we get a value of minus 156, minus 112, which is minus 168 kilojoules per mole. Only one mark, so really we don't need to show the workings to get the credit here. I just think it's great habits to get into to show the actual calculations that you're doing. And then, as is often the case, this question moves on to a calorimetry question where they're getting us to do something very similar than using the data book values as shown in the previous question. So they were data book values and now we're doing an actual experiment to do it. And I'll show a diagram of the experiment at the bottom. So a student is adding 0 0.210 moles of pure anhydrous copper sulfate. So for a start, they're being a bit mean here because sometimes they get us to calculate the moles of copper sulfate that we're using, using mass over MR, but they're taking that mark from us here and they're just telling us the moles. So anticipate this is how amount of substance can get built into this required practical by getting you to calculate the moles. 
and then they're adding it to 25 cubic centimetres of deionized water in an open polystyrene cup, which sounds like a mistake. I really think that we should be having a lid, but we'll get back to that in a later question. And then we're told that an exothermic reaction occurs. We know that because anhydrous copper sulfate was shown to be exothermic on the previous page. And the temperature increased by 14 degrees Celsius. And then the question moves on to say that we need to use these data to calculate the enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole for this reaction of copper 2 sulfate. And so this is the, the value for delta H1 in the previous question, but we are generating a student value for it through experimental data rather than looking at the data book. And then they give us a little bit of additional information to help us in our calculation. They first of all tell us that we're using 25 grams of water. Sometimes they leave that to you to work out by telling you that the density of water is one gram per cubic centimetre and you have to make that deduction that 25 cubic centimetres is therefore 25 grams. But that's also the same assumption that you make if you're working with a solution whether it's water or a solution, we assume one gram per cubic centimetre. Then we're also told that the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18 joules per kelvin per gram. We should be used to seeing that. They even tell us that for solutions as well, that we can assume the specific heat capacity is the same. And so this approach here, first of all, we need to work out Q equals MC delta T. That is the energy change between the chemicals and the surroundings. So how much energy was given out or taken in? We know it was given out, in fact, because it was an exothermic reaction. So Q equals MC delta T. M is 25 because the 25 is the mass of the liquid that is being heated. You never include the mass of the solid that is being added to a liquid, whether it's water or a solution. It's only the mass of the liquid whose temperature is changing. And C is 4.18 and the temperature change is 14, which when we get our calculation, we get a value of 1,463 joules. We need to recognize that that then needs to be turned into kilojoules, 1.46 kilojoules. Some people like turning their masses straight into kilograms and knowing that that gives us an energy in kilojoules. It's okay either way, either way that you prefer to do that. Ultimately, though, we need to know that for our final step, when we use our enthalpy change calculation, we need to have that value for Q in kilojoules at that point. And then we move on to the final mark then, which is for the enthalpy change. So there's two different ways of remembering this, and people prefer one or the other, and, but they're both okay, provided you can use them accurately. And so enthalpy change is in kilojoules per mole, so we need to divide our energy, Q, in kilojoules by moles, and that gets us our value of, to three significant figures, 69.7 kilojoules per mole, because we've divided 1.463 by 0 0.0210, so the value is getting bigger. And if we're dividing Q as a scalar quantity, as in it's just got a magnitude, a size, a value, then the value for the enthalpy change doesn't necessarily have the correct sign. And what that means is we need to recognise that the temperature has increased by 14 degrees, which means this is exothermic. And they've actually told us that here, but they don't always. And so that means that the enthalpy change is a negative one. So our value of 69.67 needs to be a negative 69.7 kilojoules per mole. Now, I said there was an alternative way. Some people like to use delta H is minus Q divided by N. That only works if you have the discipline to make a, a temperature decrease have a negative value. So if the temperature had gone down by 14 and you want to use this method, you'd have to plug in minus 14 into your Q equals MC delta T. And so that's a really important thing to remember that if you're going to use minus Q over N, which is fine, you need to remember that the delta T will sometimes be negative for an endothermic reaction in order to make sure you have that negative sign. Personally, I prefer the first one that I mentioned where you work out the enthalpy change and then you look to go, right, it's exothermic, so I'm going to put that negative sign in. But it's up to you. And then the question goes on to say, well, 
why might this value for the student calculation not be the same as the data book value? And in fact, they've been more specific. Why might it be less accurate? And so I mentioned earlier the fact that they left the lid off and so there's definitely going to be heat loss to the surroundings. And so we need to communicate that, that this beaker is not perfectly insulated, even though we're using polystyrene. Alternatively, you could say that there was an incomplete reaction, although it's a dissolving. So what you might want to do here is be more specific and say that not all of the copper sulfate has dissolved because it's an enthalpy of solution that we are calculating. And then the final part of the question says, suggest one reason why the value for enthalpy change of the experiment cannot be measured directly. Well, I already sort of hinted at that when I annotated the Hess cycle, and we've got the anhydrous copper sulfate, and then that is turning into the hydrated copper sulfate, which has got the formula cuso 45 h 20 And when you are hydrating your copper sulfate, it is absolutely impossible to add precisely the right amount of water so that we end up with five molecules of water for each mole of copper sulfate. Not only that, there is another way of working this out, and that is that we could say that, well, how do you actually measure the temperature rise of a solid accurately? That's very difficult as well. And you could also say that when you're adding your water, how do you stop the solid dissolving? How do you make sure that you hydrate it all equally so the solid just becomes hydrated and none of it dissolves? I think that's unrealistic. You're likely to make some solution during that process. And just before I finish, I think I should also mention that at this point that in a question like this, I think it leads very nicely into a potential water of crystallization calculation. So instead of maybe being asked that question about suggesting why it's not possible to measure this directly, they could follow up and ask you to work out the water of crystallization for copper sulfate and prove that it is 5H2O. So maybe proving that this was hydrated properly, for instance. That would be a nice way of tying in amounts of substance with calorimetry in this required practical. Okay, that's the end of this calorimetry walkthrough video. Hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.